This was, uh, well, welcome everybody to the lab. This was an um, interesting request to talk to the NUG, uh, not as the nurse director. So um, Sudeep's going to tell you all about the future of NERSC, and um, I'm going to tell you about some other things, including some stuff I've been uh, kind of related to work that I've been doing in research, but to try to tell you where what I think the important problems are um, in computing as you look forward towards uh, exascale platforms and things like that. Um, I did want to just welcome all of you to the lab. Whoops, this is not going to work. I just, I'll just, that's okay, this is fine. Yeah. Um, and uh, so here we are at the lab, and I think uh, if you were like me, you might have gotten stuck on the way in the entrance this morning behind a cement mixer. Um, and that's, of course, because we're building a new building, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And, uh, you know, I, so I won't, since most of you, I think almost all of you, not, not everybody, but almost all of you are Berkeley Lab people, I won't go through um, some of the slides on Berkeley Lab, except to say that if you look at all the initi major initiatives across the lab, um, they really all do uh, involve computation as well as um, other science disciplines. And so there's images from some of the work that goes on across the lab or related to, uh, computational problems to work that goes on in photon sciences, energy and environment, biosciences, cosmology and physics, and, uh, and of course, computing itself. So um, what am I doing now that I'm no longer nurse director? I'm uh, the associate lab director. And what that means is that I'm actually in charge of the uh, NERSC uh, ESNet and the Computational Research Division. Um, so I think most of you know that as well. But I did want to put in one kind of plug for or um, discussion about ESNet, because I don't think the NERSC people are necessarily all familiar with ESNet. And for those of you who are at remote institutions or are involved in science projects at other institutions, it's important to understand that um, the network is also an instrument that you can use in science. Um, and it, want, it is one that you might want to um, work with people at NERSC who can also hook you up with people at ESNet. Um, in order to uh, figure out how to move large data sets around. So ESNet um, has just recently gone through an upgrade. ESNet 5 is in production, which is uh, the first 100 gigabit per second transcontinental uh, or continental scale network. Um, it has upgrade capacity in the form of dark fiber. Um, but what really this is, is it's, a, it's not like you know, going out and buying internet services from AT&T or Verizon or one of those companies, because it's really about the ability to send large data sets around. And so although it is the network that connects all of you to all the other labs and then out to the rest of the internet, because there's all these uh, agreements of peering partners and so on that, they, it, that uh, connects ESNet to all the other networks in the world, um, this, there are facilities that you can use to really send huge data sets around. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, I guess one of the numbers that I don't have on here is uh, what happens if you try to send these large data sets, like terabyte data sets, around on another network. They were, um, I think Eli Dart was recently doing, a, a, or Brian Tierney were, were doing a project where they were transferring data between Argonne and Berkeley Lab. And they found that because of some of the loss in the internals of the network, so normal networks will drop packets once in a while and things will get retried and it works fine. But when you try to do this with a large science flow in the middle, um, they saw the, the, the science bandwidth, the bandwidth slowed down by a factor of 80. So why is this important to you? If you have a large data set at NERSC that you want to put someplace else or another data set someplace else that you want to bring to NERSC, you really want to make sure that that network path between the two facilities is well optimized. There's a, a bandwidth reservation service in ESNet called OSCARS, and if you're sending large data sets around and you don't know about that, you should. There's also information about how to set up a uh, you know, data transfer nodes, which are things we have at NERSC, um, the science DMZ idea uh, to really build a uh, high-speed connection on the other end. So there's information about how to do that. So uh, a little bit about uh, big data within DOE. So there's a picture, the artist rendition of the new building. Um, and some of the specs over there about how, how big it is and how expensive it is and things like that. It's a, uh, um, a very, uh, it's a very I efficient building, um, and it's going to be a very efficient data center, uh, scientific computing center. Um, it is one of the, probably the most energy efficient ones within DOE and the most within the Office of Science, and that is because the temperature that you uh, experience outside is the temperature almost uh, a, a year round here at Berkeley. It's very rare to have very hot temperatures, which means you can use the ambient um, air temperature to actually cool the computers in the building. And, uh, you know, we, we did a little analysis, a back of the envelope calculation in 2010. That was when Hopper was, uh, I think it was be, be, uh, when, when we just had Franklin. I hadn't, haven't updated this yet for just the uh, Hopper 
um, configuration, but we had about 200 publications, 200, sorry, 450 publications per megawatt year, okay? So um, I challenge any other computing center to produce that many papers in a megawatt year. Um, so this is just dividing the number of publications by the number of megawatts we use that year. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways we can look at efficiency, and that's what's going to come up when I talk about the future and what we're worrying about in the future machines. So enough about the lab. By the way, I'm, I'm also very happy to answer any questions that people have because it's a small audience, so we might as well ask, ask you take advantage of that. All right, so... Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of computing and kind of start with by looking back at the past. And um, I was just actually talking to a, uh, a computer scientist in um, human-computer interfaces working on really cool problems, um, uh, you know, how to get rid of laptops entirely by just projecting things on your, on your hand and, um, and using, you know, motions of your fingers so you don't even have to carry a laptop around anymore. And he said, oh, but my computer's fast enough. I really don't need anything faster than that, which is a common perception, I think, that most computer scientists scientists have. And so I, I like to do this little thought exercise where I say, well, what are two of the things that we really care about, everybody in the world cares about, um, even if you're not a computational scientist, where you might understand more about the importance of high-performance uh, computers. And that is an I, uh, some kind of a smartphone, uh, so let's say an iPhone, and a uh, uh, and searching Google. So if we, so in 2013, you know, these are commonplace. We use them all the time. We use them multiple times a day. Um, and uh, if you roll back into 1993, um, you know, what do these devices look like? Well, um, you know, certainly there's a lot of really creative user interfaces in these things. There's creative algorithms in both Google. You know, there's a symmetric eigenvalue problem inside of the uh, uh, the page ranking algorithm. There's a uh, um, you know, there's a, a bunch of speech recognition and so on in the iPhone, but if you roll back um, 20 years, you end up with, you know, the NERSC supercomputer um, on your, in your hand, right? So, so it, you, you needed all those creative people, all those creative algorithms, um, all that new software, but you also needed faster, smaller, cheaper, denser computers. And so, um, you know, as we move forward, people say, oh, well, we don't need any faster computers, but you do. In order to get innovations like this, you really do need computers that are going to be much faster, much smaller, and much cheaper. And um, Google, so, you know, how much... Uh, uh, you know, what, what would you need to have Google? Well, first of all, you need uh, a few gigawatts of power. So uh, where do you get a few, gig, 30, say, 30 gigawatts of power, which is about what um, you would be using in power in 1993 if you tried to build a Google data center, kind of estimated for what you think is inside a single Google data center? Well, Google, of course, is a green company. They like to advertise you only use green power. So where, can anybody tell me, where can you find, let's say, 20 to 30 gigawatts of, of hydropower? So cheap green hydro, not necessarily cheap, but green hydropower. Canada? Canada. <laughs> uh, Three Gorges Dam in China. So um, at least that's, that's one of the uh, biggest hydro plants I could find available. And uh, so that's a lot of, what's that? Not in 1993, that's true. <laughs> that would have been a little problem in 1993. But if we halted the progress on computers in 1993 and just had the, well, progress as such as it is in other things, then, then that's where we could get that much hydropower. So, um, so now a thought exercise rolling 20 years forward. And this is always really dangerous because it's really hard to make these kind of predictions. But uh, the first prediction is there's no personal computers. There's no departmental computers. There are only client devices which are embedded, uh, perhaps. And as I said, you know, people are trying to get rid of keyboards and they're trying to get rid of screens. And so uh, we may not even really see computers. And, there's, and then there's the cloud, right? So um, and the cloud is where, including, you know, we, we don't like to call NERSC a cloud, but it's out there. It's a place that you can do scientific kind of um, computing. And we don't travel very much because we do a lot more telepresence. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, lectures teach to millions of students. You know, we're running one of these MOOC courses uh, on campus at UC Berkeley. Um, you know, these are courses that have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students in them. It's a really interesting teaching experience from what I've been told. I haven't tried one yet, but uh, uh, don't ever, uh, one of the rules is never hand out a homework assignment that has a mistake in it. That's the first rule of teaching a MOOC. Um, so, you know, theorems, you know, theorems might be proven online. If you aren't familiar with this thing, you can look at a web page called Polymath. So, you know, there's sort of more automatic thing. Maybe that one's a little bit more of a stretch. Um, 
users never log into the NERF system. So this, I think, is actually going to happen sooner, and it's already happening today, right? There are a lot of people that actually use NERFs that don't directly log into the systems. Probably most of you who are NERF users in this room actually do log in and you submit jobs and things like that. But there are other people that are coming in through science gateways um, that are using, that are actually just accessing the data that comes from NERF simulations. So the climate community, for example, is you know long ago given up on the idea that everybody who is doing climate uh, science is running jobs at NERSC or certainly writing the code at NERSC uh, or other places. They're, they're looking at the data that comes from these. So um, we have to think, and NERSC has been really trying to, to um, figure this out, how to support more users kind of indirectly who, are, who we don't even get to count as users. So we've had a big debate about how we count all these people that use NERSC indirectly. Um, computers intuit what jobs should be run. So, okay, this one might sound kind of... Uh, you know, crazy too, but um, the, you know, this also is sort of an idea behind some of the gateways. So if you look at something like the Materials Genome Project where you've got tens of thousands of simulations being run, it is not unreasonable for um, some algorithm to say, you know, here's a space of the, here's part of the design space, if there's enough structure on it that we think should be filled in by simulations. Or the user asks uh, queries coming in from a, a web interface about some particular material, and a bunch of jobs get run, in, run based on what that is. So, um, you know, the idea that you're not directly logging in and submitting batch uh, jobs and so on is, uh, I think, not, not such a crazy idea. No users actually visit the other user facilities either. So it's already the case, why do we have so few people in the room? Because people don't really come to NERSC to use NERSC, right? They mostly, all of you, just log in remotely. And um, what surprised me, I was, I was at a meeting where somebody was talking about big data and data in science and data in medicine and things like that. And this person was actually doing um, medical experiments. And I figured, well, medical experiments, you have to be there, right? You have to be there with the subjects. And they said, well, actually, you can outsource um, uh, experiments on mouses to China. So you can go and basically rent a mouse or buy a mouse in China or a whole bunch of them. So you buy 100 mice and you say, run this experiment for me. And they say, well, you know, what if you don't trust the labs because you don't know, you know, who are the people that are running these things? And, and uh, you say, well, you buy three sets of 100 mice in China at different labs and you run the experiments and you get the results back and that people are doing um, medical experiments that way as well. And we see this at the advanced light source that there is an increasing trend towards move, you know, sending the material or whatever it is to the light source and having somebody there run it. And it changes the model of what the user facilities are. So we need to think about what this means for the kind of science that DOE does, um, for big team science, um, and so on. And I'll leave that for you to think about. Okay, so now my next kind of high-level discussion is about um, the, the world of high-performance computing and the politics of it and this uh, kind of big data versus exascale discussion that has been going on uh, for a while now. Uh, and, un and unfortunately, it's, they're, 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 it's been cast as a versus um, in the, uh, in the discussions, but I think it's important to go back and think about within DOE, where did, um, where did high performance computing kind of grow up in terms of the, the growth of um, the HPC program within DOE? And it started with, the, I think, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty on the NNSA side, which really said that you have to use modeling and simulation because we're very restricted in the kind of experiments that we can do. And so that sort of said that the balance between do, doing data analysis on the one hand and simulation on the other hand kind of shifted more towards simulation within the NNSA. And I think that the Office of Science took advantage of that in the Oscar program and said, yes, well, there's a lot of important science problems that can be done with simulation in science as well. And the, the focus has been on um, simulation rather than on data analysis. Now, at the moment, whoops, because um, you know, there's, there's these huge growth in data rates coming from CCD technology, coming from sequencing technology, and so on. We're seeing a shift towards data analysis, that there are big data problems that are coming from things like the next generation light source plans here, um, from the Bell 2 experiment, from, um, from the sequencers at JGI, and so on. So it doesn't say that uh, simulation is no longer relevant or that data analysis is the only thing we should be worrying about, but that there is um, a shift and that we, we do need to focus on, or that data analysis was never done before, um, but, but just that I think there is a, an important shift, at least within the Office of Science, where there are huge experimental facilities producing huge data sets. Okay, and by the way, it doesn't really matter what the balance is up here because both of these things rely on having faster computers. And that kind of goes back to your, the little iPhone and Google exercise. You really need to have faster computers uh, or, and cheaper, more, more plentiful computation in order to solve some of these problems. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's see. I'll say a little bit about um, the kind of science trends, and, and I, I think these are somewhat different examples than um, Sudeep will use, but these are, these are examples from NERSC. But I, I like to think of the science that we all do um, in computation as being divided up between large-scale science, um, that is, petascale up to exascale simulations, what I call volume, science and volume, which is about running massive numbers of simulations. Some people call it capacity computing, but um, it, I think it's actually something a little bit more uh, uh, well-defined than that, which are people that want to run ensembles that are very, uh, that, that are uh, closely related to each other, and we need to have support for those kinds of ensemble simulations, whether you're doing uh, uncertainty quantification or some kind of screening through uh, um, biology data or uh, materials data or whatever, and then the data analysis side of things where you've got huge data sets. So, you know, things get oversimplified, and um, I think the one thing I, I want to make sure everybody in this room understands is that exascale is not only about the top thing. It's about technology needed to solve any of these problems that require more computing performance. Um, so science at scale, here's, you know, one example. So climate models, of course, are very large-scale computations, although they also do run a large number of them. This is just, you know, a slide about some of the, uh, the, the history of climate modeling at NERSS. NERSS has been involved in um, the uh, IPCC, runs a climate for, since the, uh, certainly since AR4. And, um, you know, going forward, why do we care about faster computing and climate modeling? Well, one of the examples is because you want to do cloud resolution. You, if you want to resolve clouds, you need to have a, a computer that is significantly faster. Um, I think Gil isn't here, but I, Gil Campo, who's doing more of the data analysis side of climate change, when we were talking at the uh, BER requirements workshop, he also mentioned that he needed, uh, you know, about 100 times more um, computing uh, power in order to analyze, to reconstruct data sets. So he's doing um, this 20th century reanalysis, which is reconstructing uh, data from, um, from uh, very sparse data sets that exist. And he said in order to get some of the um, uh, effects of, uh, get things like cyclones and stuff in, back into the reconstructed data, he needs to have um, faster computation because um, what happens right now is you're kind of averaging over this very sparse and very noisy data set and you, um, you'll average out some of these kinds of interesting local events. So here's the materials genome one, and um, I won't say a lot more about it other than, you know, the, the goal here is to, um, is to increase the, um, the, to decrease the, the uh, amount of time that it takes to get from the design of a new material into manufacturing, to cut that in half, it's about eight, um, 18 months, I think you should say right there, um, the, uh, um, the, uh, the delay in the des design time. Is it 18 years, David? It is 18 years, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and um, the, uh, you know, the idea is to search through a whole space of related materials and then cut down the, uh, uh, to the interesting part of the space so that you're not, at, you're going, when you go back into the lab and, and synthesize things that you're not actually, or, or searching for things that exist, that you're not uh, searching through the entire space. And so this gets into the case where you really want um, a sophisticated uh, interface to being able to drive the simulations. You don't want to submit each one of these jobs one at a time. Um, and then in the uh, genomics area, you know, the, the uh, move of JGI computing into NERSC has been an important thing that has affected um, all the different parts of NERSC. That group that came from JGI is now fully integrated into NERSC and has affected the kind of systems. Um, there's now, you know, these cluster systems that have been, um, that have been built up for, uh, specifically for the JGI workload, but we're also seeing that um, we're using that for other parts of the space, whether it's physics or um, other, other areas where people have the need for just sort of uh, generic clusters because they're doing either smaller scale things or more data and analytics problems. And um, the knowledge base is um, this, I guess, uh, project that's been going now for about a year, I guess, within DOE and um, BER, which is to try to build a, uh, to take all of these different tools for analyzing biological data and to put it into a single play, pay, space. Um, so this is the uh, gro historic growth chart of um, machines that are actually on the Gordon Bell Prize list, not on the top 500 list. Um, and, you know, the uh, kind of major transitions that have happened in here were that was the attack of the killer micros, which caused us to go from vector supercomputers to MPPs. Um, and then in about 2004, um, the uh, rest of the world getting parallel computing, which is when you stopped seeing the clock speed scaling of individual processors and instead went to multi-core. 
And then the, uh, what we're, John Shelf likes to call the attack of the killer cell phones, which is where you have to really look at more energy efficient devices and more energy efficient processors. And by the way, if you uh, look at the top 500 numbers on the same graph, it looks roughly the same on a log scale. So um, the, whether, whatever you're looking at here, you, you do see um, this kind of growth in the, uh, the, computing, the computing performance, both from the LINPAC benchmark, but also from the Gordon Bell prizes, which are, by the way, also, of course, very highly optimized codes. Now, um, I want to make one kind of side comment about uh, the cost of running NERSC and uh, the cost of cloud computing because there is, because the, Cloud providers like Amazon, Yahoo, and Google have done an incredibly good job of making you think that cloud computing is free. It's only 10 cents per core hour. It sounds really cheap until you give them your credit card and you start running some jobs on it, and then you realize how quickly you can rack up a, a pretty hefty bill. And um, as part of the Magellan Project, which I think we've, we've talked about before um, at, these, at one of the NUG meetings, but just to remind you, the uh, estimated total annual cost of running NERSC, if we were just to buy the computing in the cloud, um, would be about $200 million a year. And by the way, that doesn't account for the fact that many of your codes would run uh, substantially slower on the current commercial clouds than they would in the, uh, in the, uh, um, than they do on the NERSC systems. And these are kind of list prices, so they do overestimate the cloud costs, but they also underestimate the cloud costs in many different ways. So as I said, it doesn't measure the slowdown, and it doesn't take into account that um, you don't get any consulting on the uh, uh, in the cloud for that are scientific uh, computing experts. There's no real account management. There's no software support, and all of those things are about a third of NERSC's budget. And and further, uh, you know, why is this true? So so you know, why is it that Google can't? Um, provide computing more efficiently than NERSC can because they have a larger scale of computing than, than NERSC and the idea is economies of scale and the answer is they probably can. Uh, they can actually buy computing a infrastructure at slightly less than NERSC, although NERSC is pretty far up the efficiency curve, right? We're all already buying a very large scale systems, um, buying very large quantities of power. The power here at the Hill is very, um, is actually pretty green and also very inexpensive relative to what you would pay in, say, a traditional commercial setting. So NERSC has many of the benefits of cloud computing at scale, but at, we run at much higher utilization. So over 90% utilization, whereas most of the cloud facilities are struggling to get over about 60% utilization. Many of them run much lower than that. And um, the, curse, the cost per core hour you know, went from when I started at the end of 2007, actually technically it was January of 2008, but in 2007, so that was when Franklin was installed. It was in October of 2007. Um, until we installed um, Hopper, and I guess last year when we'd had both Hopper and Franklin running for a while, that the, the number of core hours um, went up by a factor of 10 in that, in that four-year period. And in that same period of time, the cost of buying a core hour uh, at Google, or at Amazon, sorry, um, in their EC2 cloud dropped by 15%. So, um, you know, a factor of 10 versus 15%, we all understand uh, that difference. Okay, so I think you, many of you have seen this slide. This is the canonical exascale slide. It says that the main problem we have in getting to exascale is about uh, performance, uh, I mean, sorry, is about power and how to make machines, uh, how to make it possible to actually build a machine that you can afford to turn on um, because if you just look at Moore's Law scaling, you'd have uh, about $200 million in, uh, in power costs just to run, just to pay for the power bill at NERSC. So, um, I'm now going to sort of switch and talk about um, you know, what I think all of you who are writing codes and worrying about the next generation of architectures um, and what these systems will look like should be thinking about in terms of the future of these, these uh, codes and, and what are the problems. And the first problem is that communication is very expensive. It's expensive both in time, um, and that's the, the little table up there in the upper right. Um, it's, uh, those are the... Uh, the uh, annual improvements in floating point operations per second, which is 59%, and bandwidth and in latency. Now you say, but, but flop stopped getting faster, right? In 2004, you just told me that. But this is the throughput rate of a single chip has continued to go up roughly by 59% uh, a, a year. It slowed down a little bit. But, uh, and we are going to have a problem uh, in the next 10 years or so when we're going to start running out of transistor scaling as well. Um, but the, the bottom graph then looks at the amount of energy that's used to do different operations with the, in the computer. So this is in picojoules. And um, if you're doing arithmetic, you're there uh, today at um, around 100 picojoules and projecting forward at uh, more like 20 picojoules. Um, accessing something in a register is significantly less energy, but as soon as you go off chip, 
Um, even to local DRAM memory, you're up at, to one to two orders of magnitude more in terms of the energy consumption. So given that the problem of exascale is really about saving energy, uh, we need to minimize the amount of data movement. So we also have to be careful to separate bandwidth problems, which is the number of words being moved, and from latency problems, which is the number of separate messages that are being moved. And, um, and these things are hard to change. The uh, latency problems are really about physics, right? You can't get any better than uh, the, the speed of light across the machine room. And bandwidth is about money, which uh, Sudeep now understands very well. Uh, if, and I'm sure he did before as well. But you know, this is really about, I mean, when you go and talk to the vendors in a negotiation, you say, well, we want twice as much bisection bandwidth. And they say, OK, well, you know, that'll cost you substantially more money in order to get that much bandwidth. And, um, and if there's only a small part of the workload that can benefit from it, it may not may not make sense. Besides that, there's a kind of point of diminishing returns. Once you've spent 90% of your budget on memory bandwidth and network bandwidth, uh, it, it, there, there isn't much left in order to take away from computing, um, in order to put computing into the, the uh, bandwidth uh, of the machine. So the strategies are slightly different for these uh, different, uh, the different uh, cost components of communication. When, you, when it comes to latency, you can try to overlap it, right? You can hide it um, by doing other things on the computer. It doesn't make the latency go away, but it does make it less painful and less expensive in your, at the algorithmic level. Whereas in bandwidth, the only, way you, the only thing you can do, it's more fundamental usually in the algorithms. The only thing you can do is come up with new um, algorithms that, uh, that don't send so much data. OK. So Another thing I stole from John Shelf, not the picture, but the, uh, the idea is, you know, that there was this idea um, more than 10 years ago about the memory wall, that we hit the memory wall, and the memory wall is going to stop us, and the multi-core made the memory wall worse. Um, and multi-core didn't cause this problem, but, you know, bandwidth, the gap between bandwidth and computational uh, capability on a single chip has continued to grow. And, um, but the way to think about this is not as a wall, but as a swamp. And you walked in, we've been walking into that swamp um, for years, and we're going to continue walking into it because the, uh, the amount of, the number of floating point units, the amount of arithmetic uh, performance that you can put on a single processor chip is going to continue to grow much faster than bandwidth is going to grow. Um, there are technologies that we are looking at, that DOE is looking at in terms of optical, um, you know, on-chip silicon photonics uh, in the longer term and uh, in the short term trying to figure out um, memory technologies such as stacking that will uh, hopefully make this bandwidth gap a little bit better. But fundamentally, the, um, uh, the, this, this is still going to be a, a problem. So, you know, um, the, this is slide is maybe uh, starts it's starting to get old now that the election is long over. But um, you know Obama actually understands this problem, and uh, in the president's FY12 budget said that you know one of the things that DOE needed to do was to minimize the communication between processors and the memory hierarchy by reformulating the communication pattern sp specified within the algorithm. So um, now you have to be a little bit careful about taking lessons that you learned in um, in your scientific work and applying them at home or applying them in an other setting like in the de debate in Denver, um, I think that Obama might have taken uh, communication avoidance a little bit too seriously. Um, so let's say, so I, I have a few lessons now for all of you who are writing scientific software, designing algorithms, or, or, or supervising people who are. The first one is to really understand the communication limits. Um, and for this, I'd like to use Sam Williams' um, roofline model. Uh, how many people are familiar with the roofline model? Okay, yeah, I have all the co-authors of Sam's papers and the local, the local people. <laughs> no, this is, so this is a nice way to think about um, the, the fundamental limit of bandwidth in your systems. And you can apply it. I'll, I'll talk here about what it looks like in, in between the memory, the DRAM of a single processor and the uh, processing chip, although you can apply this to other parts of the memory hierarchy. And it's a, it's a very simple model, and it's actually what I think people were using intuitively when they're trying to uh, optimize codes to minimize bandwidth. But it, uh, it just kind of captures it in a nice picture. So what is this picture like? First of all, it's important to realize it's a log-log scale. So what is on the x-axis here is, the, is a property of the algorithm, which is the computational intensity. That is the number of floating point operations per byte moved from uh, the memory into the processor chip um, versus the number of the amount of computation you, do, you can do inside the processor chip. And the y-axis is the attainable gigaflop rate that you can get for that, for that code. Um, now, what, why is it called the roof line? Well, the top, the flat part of the roof, is the peak floating point performance of the hardware. So the other lines on here are all about hardware characteristics, so they're fixed for the hardware. The, the, the basic plot is fixed for a particular uh, processor. 
And you, you start with the top line, which is double precision floating point peak performance. Those are the things that the vendors always tell you. This is how fast my processor goes. Um, and, uh, um, but then if you don't actually use fuse multiply add instructions on a lot of processors, you drop down by a factor of two. Remember, it's a log scale. And if you don't use SIMD operations, you might drop by another factor of two. And if you don't use um, instructional level parallelism, that is careful scheduling of your instructions, you'll drop by, down by another factor of two. That's the without ILP line. Um, so this gives you a sense of how fast you should be going in terms of the floating point performance of the processor. Now. What the, the diagonal line is maybe a little bit harder to, uh, to kind of get an intuition about, but it is just it is the, the um, bandwidth between the memory and the processor. And um, you start with a peak bandwidth, so that's the kind of guaranteed not to exceed number. But if you're not using software prefetch on a lot of memory systems, you actually won't get that peak performance. You might drop by another factor of two or so. If you're not using the NUMA architecture, a, a structure of the um, architecture like on, on Hopper, many of you who have done uh, kind of careful optimization of, of the, the node code on Hopper know that the NUMA structure there is very important, um, then you might drop by another factor of two. So um, if you kind of cancel out by, you know, bytes per second, the bandwidth numbers there, um, and put this on the graph, you end up with these diagonal lines. And so that also limits your performance. So your goal in optimizing code, of course, is to try to move your code over into higher computational intensity, which all of you knew before I told you about the roofline model. But this gives you a little bit more concrete um, kind of picture of what the limits are um, on that system. And so some work, so I think there's some of Stefan's results here, the GTC things with um, other people at the lab whole bunch of people have worked on each one of these points. This is optimizing a number of different computational kernels for two different architectures, Intel Nehalem and the NVIDIA Fermi system. And uh, what you can see is that the, um, all, the performance of these is all over the place, um, but that you are, you know, roughly they do kind of match the roof line. That is, if you work really hard at optimizing these codes, you can get them to be bandwidth limited. Um, I don't have, I don't, didn't bring this particular graph, but it is also the case that if you take an average nurse, an average nurse application and you run it on the, on, on the system, it often is not pegging the memory bandwidth. So it's important to realize that, um, yes, these problems indeed, as you would expect, this is sparse matrix vector multiply, is indeed memory bandwidth limited. Stencil operations typically are bandwidth limited. Um, but many times the actual code that people are running is not. So there's often a fair amount of headroom in there. And understanding this uh, roofline model can help you. Number two is that, that in order to get um, better, better bandwidth utilization, you need to do higher level optimization. So um, you know, that previous slide was all about optimizing little tiny kernels in the code. Um, GTC, by the way, is off the roof line because it is doing uh, essentially atomic updates on t uh, in an irregular pattern. But the real problem is that it's going to be limited by synchronization rather than being limited by um, the ba memory bandwidth or the uh, floating point speed of the, of the processor. And DGEM, dense matrix multiplies up there. But these are little tiny pieces of these large complex applications, trying to get them to go as fast as possible on an individual processor. Um, but the, the name of the game now, if, you, if, you're, if you're sitting here at the roof line, what can you do? And this is the position we were in a few years ago in, uh, in this Bebop project where we were looking at these sparse matrix vector multiply things. We said, well, there, well you know, what do we do? We can't, we can't beat the bandwidth on the machine. So the answer is, well, you look at a higher level kernel and see if you can uh, avoid bandwidth by optimizing at a higher level. So the example of that is something like sparse matrix vector multiply. Um, let me just, uh, let's see, go to my, my other picture here for a minute, that one. Um, which says in a sparse matrix vector multiply, what you want to do is um, do a, you, you need to read the matrix and then do a matrix vector multiply, you know, so multiply each one of those entries in the matrix. And what was really discouraging is when we looked at the performance of this, I mean, this is another way of saying that it was sitting on the roof line, is basically the amount of time to do a matrix vector multiply, sparse matrix vector multiply, is limited by the time to read the matrix. So you can't do anything. You've got to read the matrix, right? So the question is, can you read the matrix once and take multiple iterative steps because you are in an iterative solver reading that matrix over and over again. So the idea is we'll pick up a little piece of the matrix and of course a sparse matrix is really just an unstructured graph. So we'll pick up a little piece of our unstructured graph. We're doing nearest neighbor computation. That's an SPMV operation on it. Um, so in order to do the update on that vector, which are the nodes in that graph, we need to get a slightly larger region. So we need to get the neighboring points there so we can c compute the next value of the interior of the graph. 
Um, and we need to, if we want to do two steps with one read of the matrix, then we need to get a slightly bigger piece of it, so that means all the edges as well, and three steps and so on. So, um, so we actually did this, and um, you, can actually, you can actually make sparse matrix vector multiply um, go much faster if you do them k steps at a time. That is, you do a to the k times x rather than doing a times x. Um, but you're now, you now have a, uh, a higher level um, computation. So this says um, a to the k times x is actually faster than doing k versions of a times x because you're not reading a over and over again. Um, now it gets a little bit more complicated, and I won't go into the details, but um, you know, we have to understand the numerics because we're going to take this new thing and stick it into middle, in the middle of our iterative solver. In particular, we'll put it into GMRES. Um, so GMRES is you know, an, an iterative solver that has a sparse matrix vector multiply in it. In the new algorithm, it's going to have that a to the k thing in there. You can see that the w equals the, that vector there. So we stick in our a to the k kernel. There's some other stuff going on with reductions that I won't talk about right now um, that also have to do with communication. But um, So to a compiler person, this looks like kind of a, a loop interchange idea. We have the, the k loop on the outermost there, there and we're going to just take that k loop and kind of stick some of it on the inside there. You know, um, Once we read the matrix, then we'll do k steps, except that it's completely illegal compiler transformation. We've completely changed the dependencies in the program. You no longer get the right answer. Um, and, and maybe it sort of still smells like GMRES, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't behave like GMRES. So this is how GMRES behaves in terms of its residual error. So it's an iterative solver. So you want it to get, uh, you want the error to go away as you go through the iteration counts of the solver. So this is not performance. This is uh, error that we're measuring here. Um, this is what happens when you take the new communication avoiding um, algorithm that uses the a to the k kernel, that is, does one read of the matrix for every k steps. Um, so it runs faster, but it uh, no longer converges. So not a very useful algorithm. However, it turns out that if you use a different basis called a, new, my, uh, a Newton basis, um, you can get convergence back again, and you still are using something that kind of is like a, this, this a, to, the a to the k kernel um, in there. So lots of hand waving underneath this. The high level point is um, that you shouldn't be just optimizing the, the innermost loops of your code. You need to think about, well, could I rearrange something at a much higher level that would allow me to do less communication, less data movement? And by the way, you can put this all back uh, uh, together again, and it actually does run faster to use the uh, communication avoiding part. Those are the, the uh, orange and red bars. They're all set to one there, so it's normalized to the, spe the, the faster version, and that's the, the slowdown of the uh, original version. So um, the next trick that we are using to try to, um, to optimize things is to, to um, not get hung up on the owner computes rule. So I'll tell you a little story about matrix multiply, um, but this is really not about matrix multiply. It's really about all these. Um, we're, we're actually now trying to generalize it to arbitrary loopness. Um, but the, the basic idea in which I think a lot of people go into a scientific computation is you've got a physical domain. We're going to chop up the physical domain. We'll give each processor a piece of that physical domain, and they will be responsible for the updates on it. That makes, by the way, the concurrency control problems really easy. You don't usually have to worry about two processors updating the same value. So it's a nice way to organize your code. So this is some uh, performance analysis done with a new algorithm that doesn't just do domain decomposition. It actually makes multiple copies of things um, in matrix multiply. Um, so this is Edgar Solomonic, who's a grad student on campus, working with uh, Jim Demmel, his advisor, um, and doing matrix multiply. And this is running on blue gene P. And this is, a, a speed, this is running time. So this is the old algorithm, and this is the new algorithm. The new algorithm, for a reason I'll explain in a minute, is called a 2.5D algorithm. And so it's not just using this idea of chopping up the result matrix, the C matrix, if you will, and C equals A times B, into separate pieces, but actually doing something more complicated. And there's a different problem size with the, the speed up shown. So, all right, so I wasn't involved in this, but I was watching this work, and I said, well, what was I surprised about? First of all, I was surprised that any company could make matrix multiply go any faster from an algorithmic standpoint. I mean, I know there are people working on you know, making the exponent uh, a little bit uh, lower in terms of uh, Strassen's algorithms and things like that. But this is basic order n cubed matrix multiply. wasn't really changing the computation in any significant way. It was just changing the data movement so you could make it go faster. And the basic idea was to make copies of the C matrix, have different subsets of processors updating those copies independently and then re combine the results together at the end. Um, so the lesson that, uh, is so, and there's you know, some nice theory behind this that says it's provably optimal. Um, 
you, uh, uh, the lesson was you never waste fast memory. So if you've got, now you may be con con concerned that Edison or NERSC-8 or the future systems are not going to have enough memory per core, which is, um, which is always going to be a concern. But, they, it, but if at some point in the middle of the computation you have a computation that is not using all the fast memory on those systems, you want to, you, to consider um, doing something that decomposes into finer grain parallelism and then makes uh, use of all of that memory in order to get speed up. And you're doing it not to get more parallelism. You're doing it to reduce communication. So now the question is, can we take, this is just matrix multiply, can we do something for everybody else who are running other computations in the world? Um, and so this is looking at uh, what matrix multiply actually looks like um, in an iteration space, which is the way compiler writers think about it. So there's three loops, right, I, J, and K, and there's our iteration space. And you can actually then think about where the matrices A, B, and C fit because they are projections of that iteration space onto the surfaces. So the C matrix is the top and the bottom. The A matrix is the front and the back, and the, C, the B matrix are the two sides. Okay, so at every point in the middle of that iteration space, you're going to do a multiply and add, which is updating a value from each of the three spaces, the three, three um, spaces that I've shown here that are colored, and um, you know, so you need to pick up those elements. And so the question is, how do I divide up that iteration space in order to minimize the amount of surface area that gets touched by projecting out that interior region? So you can imagine, say, the way the proof goes, say, we'll pick up an arbitrary glob of stuff in the middle of this cube and figure out what its projection is and what is the smallest projection. And not surprisingly, the smallest projection is actually a cube. So um, what this says is that you actually want to chop the iteration space not just by chopping up A and B, which is the obvious way to write matrix multiply. Um, and, well, you, you chop up C, and then you kind of you know, send all the blocks of A and B around to get all the updates done. But you actually want to make copies of C and then chop up those copies. Um, and so that, that uh, divides up the, uh, the iteration space. And it's called a 2.5D algorithm because the original kind of the, the, the kind of obvious implementation based on domain, domain decomposition is a two-dimensional partitioning of the C matrix, right? It just chops it in two dimensions. And this one is actually chopping in the third dimension. So uh, it could be called a 3D algorithm, but it's kind of, for technical reasons, there's a, an extreme case where the third dimension is really big. Um, as big as possible, that's called the 3D algorithm. So this is called the 2.5D algorithm because it's, because it's somewhere in between. Okay, so you may not care about matrix multiply. You may care about other things. So the question is, can we apply this to other things? Um, actually, some of my students and I, uh, I actually do have students again, <laughs> who are uh, new students who are working on some, some of these ideas have figured out that you can apply, we've figured out that you can apply this to n-body codes. So um, I'll just to give you a hint about what the idea is, if we've got, we'll, we'll just do a really stupid n-body code here for purposes of illustration um, and because it's a lot easier to analyze. So you've got order n particles and you've got p processors. So what is the usual way that you would, you would parallelize this code? You take each processor and give it n over p particles. And then you cycle the particles around somehow so that eventually every processor sees every other particle and they do, do all the updates for the pairwise forces between them. Um, and this computational cost is n squared over p, and the communication cost is order p messages, and uh, you have to send all the data around everywhere, so it's order n words. So it turns out you can use the same replication idea. So we're kind of replicating all the particles a few times, and then within this smaller group of processors, sending all the particles around so that everybody can do a subset of the updates. So for example, the first row is responsible for all the pink updates, the second row for the green updates, the third row for the yellow updates, and so on. And you can actually prove that you get better performance out of it. Uh, uh, but you know, I, I like this quote. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. Um, and so, what do, you know, is this just a theoretical result? Well, the answer is no. You can actually get um, speed up numbers from this as well, just as you could with matrix multiply. So, it's important to think about um, you know how you might parallelize your codes in uh, uh, ways that will reduce the amount of traffic by looking at higher level kernels, and in this case, by thinking about other ways than just decomposing the data structures into independent pieces. And the other way to think about what's going on in, in both the matrix multiply case and the n-body case is kind of a replicate and then reduce. You've got, you've got make replicas of your data structures. Um, you're independently working on partial results, and then you reduce at the end to get the, uh, the full answer. OK, so have we seen this before? 
Um, yes, in fact, when I've talked about these algorithms in some audience, they say, but we use that, that algorithm for matrix multiply on the connection machine, the CM2. Um, so for those of you who, there are not very many in this room, who are old enough to remember the CM2 and the mass par machine, those were machines with little teeny tiny processors, and people did indeed use these kinds of algorithmic ideas because they, they needed so much parallelism that it wasn't, they didn't have enough parallelism that they just divided up the problem into these um, different uh, subdomains. They actually have to divide up the computation, not just divide up the data structure. Um, you do have to make, have an operator like plus, usually that's associative so that you can do these things independently and, and you are reordering the way those things are being updated, but not in a very, it's not a very significant reordering of the calculation. And um, actually in the GTC results with Stefan and others that I talked about before, um, there, there was another paper that um, was looking at synchronization avoidance um, in uh, particle and cell codes in general, and the, the same idea is being used there. The basic idea is if you need to have a bunch of processors updating something simultaneously, rather than worrying about locking over it, make a copy of the thing that you're updating, everybody updates independently, and then you combine the results together at the end. And it gets used in SIMD extensions and GPUs and so on. Okay. So um, you all know about making lar messages larger. Any good MPI programmer knows that you want to send a, a small number of messages because each message is very expensive. Um, but the opposite of that is really that you want to also overlap and pipeline your communication. So this sometimes runs contrary because in order to overlap communication and pipeline, so pipeline means overlapping communication with communication, whereas, um, and, but also overlap just means overlapping it with computation, you want to uh, start the communication as soon as possible, um, which often means you you're not ready to do all of the communication at once, so you start what you can, um, and you end up sending more messages in the end. So, um, you know, this is what the PGAS ideas are all about and um, is about really making it easy to do overlap and it's really about DMA operations, that is doing fine-grained, uh, very lightweight communication across a global address space. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is what these, the PGAS languages like UPC and Coarray, Fortran, uh, Chapel and so on look like, which is every processor has um, a chunk of the memory, which is physically what you have in the system, um, but they can access data anywhere in the system simply by doing a read and write. They don't have to ask the other processor to help them do the communication. So I also think of this as never having to say receive. Um, and so in this model, um, you, it, is, it, it, it turns out that this is closer to what the hardware actually does because down inside of a, of a MPI send and receive, there's typically a DMA operation going on there. And why do these, these kinds of programming models come up? Um, these global address space models especially come up when you have a very irregular sort of data set. So imagine that you want to compute a histogram on a huge data set that does not fit in the memory of a single processor or even on the biggest shared memory multiprocessor you can find. So you, what you do is you take your machine like um, Hopper and you spread the histogram o over all the processors. And now what you're going to have as you're computing this histogram is you've got these keys coming in and you need to put them in a bucket in the histogram. And those are going to be kind of random accesses into the middle of the machine's memory. And so that's what these global address space programming models are about, is making these kinds of things um, easier to express and actually faster uh, to execute um, in, in general. Whereas the MPI stuff, if you're really working on a physical simulation problem, it is often easier to divide up your domain physically, even if you're using the, repli the replication idea. You've got some much more structure to work with, um, and so you, you use, the, so that's why the MPI codes in practice have been, um, that, that has actually worked out. It's very painful uh, to write, to program a histogram in MPI because you don't know when to say receive, right? If you're the processor that owns the bucket that somebody else, some other processor is inserting a key into, um, it's not a very natural thing to figure out um, how to say receive in that kind of a model. So um, I think I'll skip some of this except to say that, you know, there, this is some work um, done on the milk application in, in QCD, and this is uh, Hung Zhang Shan and a bunch of others uh, who looked at the comparison between a UPC implementation and an MPI implementation um, going up to 32,000 cores. Now, this is looking at um, a slightly different version of the algorithm. So whenever you compare across programming models, you have this problem that you, you write something in a different way, sometimes in a different language. And, um, and in this case, that's indeed what happens is you get a different uh, version of the algorithm. But you do get, as you can see, much better scaling uh, of the performance of QCD. Okay. So I think um, 
I will uh, kind of wrap up and just say there are a lot of challenges um, that we're facing in the next generation of scientific computing. Um, scaling is the most obvious, but um, exascale is really not about scaling. Exascale is about figuring out how to use more energy, how to design and use and program more energy efficient processors. And um, it is also about uh, synchronization, the dynamic system behavior that we're going to see. All, you see this. Um, many of you who've run, who run very large scale simulations on Hopper do see the fact, in fact, somebody was telling me about this the other day, you know, different runs may have different performance depending on exactly where that job was laid out in the network. Um, more irregular algorithms as you get to the uh, trying to, to uh, optimize your algorithms in terms of the amount of computing you're going to do. You tend to you know, move from dense to sparse algorithms, from structured meshes to unstructured meshes or to adaptive block structured meshes. Um, so things that give you more irregularity. Um, and there's, and, and of course resilience, which I haven't talked about at all, but um, is, is uh, obviously something that uh, we worry about today with checkpoint restart, and we'll worry about even more in terms of whether you can do a checkpoint restart. But um, you know, but what's really important is still location, 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 um, and uh, all of the things that do communication near your code, whether it's communicating up and down between the processor and the memory, or communicating between the processors, continues to be um, a really important characteristic of how you optimize code. So. In conclusion, communication hurts, um, and uh, so be careful and try to minimize the amount of communication you do. Thanks.